Well, first, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, my name is Varda Makovsky, and I am the Director of Post Adoption Services at the Barker Foundation, which is located in Bethesda. Um, Barker's been around since 1945, um, and, and since then, our agency has um, been involved in about 7,000 adoptions. Um, in my role as the Post Adopt Director, I tend to handle everything all the cases that happen after finalization, which used to be between our international and our domestic programs. I used to take the cases about two years after they happened. But um, basically, because of some of these issues in open adoption and in facilitating open adoption, I have started getting involved a little bit earlier. Um, Given the topic that we're talking about, which um, is PACAs and the agreements, I really, we take a little bit of a different approach to it. Um, and I think before we even start with it, I'd like to just focus on what we view, because I think this will come into play in the things that I'm saying, the benefits of open adoption for adoptees um, and of contact with their birth parents. Um, it's been documented that there is an increased sense of personal identity, self-worth, and confidence when children have access to their birth parents. Knowing that they are loved by the birth family is very important. Um, avoiding the mystery and fantasizing regarding um, who their birth parents were particularly in the teen years, and I say this from my role as the post-adopt director, I've worked with a lot of teens and adult adoptees, it can be really, really hard, um, especially during those development years, having no background. That's when a lot of the fantasizing comes in of who they were, and whoever they were would have to be better than those people in the other room raising me, <laughs> um, which is a natural consequence if you're having the typical teenage things. So it's we've, we have seen uh, with the families that we've worked with, it really, for the most part, there's always exceptions, been healthy. And of course, the other benefit is ongoing access to evolving medical information, not just that information from the time of placement, but all the changes that have happened in the birth family since then. Um, we find that the best strategy for getting families to maintain their agreements is always getting back to the heart of what it means. Um, focusing on why this agreement was established rather than the, le the legal aspects. Oh, you have a pack out, what's on that clause? Um, and that's at all stages. That is at pre-adoption when we're training families and explaining to them what adoption is. That's when they're agreeing to their PACA agreement. And that's also ongoing support years later because some of the issues that come up can be very challenging. These are uncharted relationships that most people don't have peers to help them through. So we find there's gotta be a lot of support throughout the process. Um, we also feel like there must be genuine buy-in to open adoption and to this process by adoptive families. Um, I think before I go on, I'd like to tell you about a case that I've worked on that has also shaped a lot of the reason why, as I mentioned, I'm getting involved in cases earlier now. Um, and, I'll t and I'll give you an example of a case that I've been working with. Um, there's one of our families, I think their son is about six now, who adopted six years ago, yeah, they agreed to everything, they listened, they agreed, they signed the agreement, they really wanted to have a child, they'd been through infertility for a long time, they were kind of at the end of their rope. Um, they agreed, birth mother at the most tense time of her life agreed because she was gonna have that visit once a year, photos, etc. wanted this child to know who she was. Um, for the last three years, I would say it's been a lot of pulling teeth to try to get this family to come in for the visit. Um, I have gotten involved, and you know, is this really good for the? Is this really good for our child? You know, getting back to the same um, questions that they might have asked initially. Um, so I have been working with them for a few years. It came out at their last visit. Um, the, the adoptive mother mentioned to me, you know, how long do we have to do this for? Because he doesn't even know he's adopted. And I will say, one thing I haven't said, but 
A huge part of our education is talk about adoption from the moment the child can understand words, so it's normalized into their vocabulary. We like to preclude that aha moment that happens later on by normalizing it young. So I learned from this family, they kind of checked all the boxes, they did it, but they never bought into the spirit of it. Um, and that has made us go back to the very beginning in how we work with families. Um, because that PACA should never be viewed as a standalone agreement. It should be a part of our clinical process with adoptive parents and birth parents from the very beginning. So now, and I realize some of our models are a little bit harder for attorneys, especially who are working on their own, but a lot of these services we do with non-Barker families, with non-Barker, people that aren't directly placing through our, um, through our agency, and there's other agencies that can help. But even before someone submits an application to our agency, they've got to come to an info meeting. They have to hear what adoption is like in the year 2015. So, and right now, for the purposes of this, I'm only talking domestic. But 95% of adoptions in this country now have a degree of openness. And as Elizabeth said, that can vary from semi-open to fully open. But what I have learned in dealing with adopted adults and doing searches is that you really can't guarantee anyone secrecy anymore. It's about privacy and not secrecy, because in the way, it, with the information age that we're in, um, they can always access that information. But given that 95% of adoptions have a degree of openness, um, people need to understand what that means, um, what, what the contacts will look like, what typical uh, birth parents want. Sometimes they don't want, but most times they do. And after that process, we do have families that opt out they'll say, this really isn't for me or I need to think about it. And we think that's really good because domestic adoption is not for everyone. It has changed a lot from when, from when we were all children or our parents were children. There are other uh, alternatives for building a family in this day and age. Some of them are more accessible to some people than others, but some may opt out. Even after they apply, we still, while they're getting their paperwork together, thinking about putting their profile together, even before they're matched, we also do trainings on um, what open adoption looks like. Uh, we've got a lot of trainings that are going on. We encourage them to read. By the time those adoptive parents are matched, we feel we need a pretty good idea, and we usually have it, of who they are and what they're truly ready for. Um, is it going to be one visit a year? Is it going to be two visits a year? And they will know that. Some of them, even later in the stage, may choose international. But um, we have a pretty, pretty good idea of, of, what they're, um, of who they are. We also tell people, if they're presented with a situation, and if there's more than they can accept, it's really better that they wait. That's very hard to tell someone who's already been through infertility treatment, but I have seen down the road, 10 years later, how those cases play out. Um, and it's very hard when people accept something they're truly not ready for. Likewise, with our pre-adoption work with birth parents, we, we, from the very beginning, from the very first meeting, you know, what are you interested in? What kind of relationship, if any, would you like? Um, we also need to take their emotional state into consideration. Sometimes they'll say, I don't want anything, I just need to get as far away as possible. But they're grieving and we need, and, and I, people who are working with them need to realize they may, they may feel very differently in two or three years. And that needs to come into play also as the PACA is developed. And ultimately, after the work with both of these parties, um, we should know enough that we only match people who really want the same thing. Um, and effective counseling beforehand can, can help that. Um, the process of negotiating the PACA agreement, I know it's different in different venues. We feel it's best if, again, we know them, it's kind of like we're presenting them what we knew they were prepared to do. Um, 
I have also seen sometimes families that had such respect for each other, adoptive families and birth families, the process of sitting down and creating that PACA can be in itself the biggest cause of tension and cause everything to fall apart. It's kind of like negotiating a divorce as opposed to creating this spirit of, um, of working together. So that process is really important. Um, the first year after adoption usually tells us a lot about how this is going to work and how the family and the birth parents see the spirit of this. The focus should always be on the relationships, not on, oh, we have to adhere to the PACA. Um, and it's really important for both sides to know up front that there's going to be huge challenges and discomfort at certain periods throughout this entire process. Um, I think when people know that in advance and when they're told that in advance, um, they know to recognize it when they feel it and it can be very, very helpful. Some of the hardest times that I've seen with families who are having a real hard time maintaining the contact is when they're going through crisis themselves, if the adoptive parents are going through divorce, if, there's something, if they've lost a job and they're facing economic crisis. Um, that, those two situations, when people feel that they were brought in to kind of help this child have a better, more stable life and their lives are getting more difficult, very often they want to retreat and we need to work you know, through that with them. If there's serious issues with the child, there may be um, more feelings of inadequacy. Sometimes it can even be anger if they're feeling that it may be related to some of the issues in the birth family, if you know, a teenager is going through addiction and they knew it was in the family or things like that. But there are times that we already know that families feel difficult and part of our job is to let them know that way up front you might feel uncomfortable and it's, it, it, it's, it's a normal part of it. Also changes, um, you know, feeling challenged by certain situations, boundaries, issues, learning new information about the birth parents. Um, some of that can also cause people to feel a need um, to, to, to question what this arrangement is. Again, whenever we're going through that with families, we go back to why are we doing this in the first place? You know, why is this whole agreement in place? Um, the role of dissonance can be huge here. It's very easy for adoptive parents to rationalize that something may not be good for their child. Um, discomfort can lead to someone to look for an easy out very, very quickly. Um, I think that in addition to just going back to the why, and this is an advantage I have because I have dealt with adult adoptees, but I would say before even, if there's conflict, going, to, going back to the PACA, my biggest question is how do you think your child may feel 20 years down the road knowing that you cut this off with, your, with, with their birth parents? Because I have seen less in open adoption cases because these are a little bit more recent. But when I have sat with adult adoptees and they find out that their birth parents tried to maintain contact or sent messages or wanted some kind of connection and their adoptive parents rebuffed it, <coughs> that almost always boomerangs onto the relationship between the adult adoptee and their adoptive parents. And in my opinion, when I broach that with adoptive parents, that's a lot more effective. Um, in getting them to think through what this means than talking about violating PACA as a legal issue. Um, so again, you know, we almost, that, that's kind of the approach that we take. Um, we also expect and recognize that there will be ongoing challenges with this. So we do a lot of post-adoption, even for families that adopted five years ago, 10, 15, 10 years ago. And these are not just open to people in our agency, and you should know there's other agencies around that do this, but sessions on communication with birth parents. Sometimes people need to go back in there and hear a refresher. The challenges, joys, and complexities of open adoption, that's another one that we've done. Um, also a lot of one-on-one -on -one counseling. We have an, a support group in our agency for adoptive parents in open and semi-open adoption, and there's nothing like that peer experience. I can counsel them, other people can counsel them, 
But by and large, adoptive parents and open adoption are hearing from their parents especially, but from their families, are you crazy? You're letting the birth parent meet them? They're gonna run away with the child? Did you see that movie? I mean, there's all these crazy movies. They really need to talk to other people in the same position when we try to bring them together, and that is a very good venue for them. Likewise, for the birth parents. You know, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one counseling to try to help them through it, but we also have had for over 20 years a birth parent um, support and discussion group that meets, and again, these are open to everyone, um, where birth parents can come in and talk about both their feelings about having placed, but also um, process any kind of connection that they might be having. Um, so in short, I think that's our approach, which is really to, um, again, focus on the meaning behind it and try to support families as they go through it. And thank you very much.